Thanksgiving theme. And um, when I read it, I thought, oh, well, Lord, that just about covers everything I should be thankful for. So as I, I read it, you'll see it pretty much incorporates everything. And now that I'm getting older, I have to wear glasses. So <laughs> um, it's, it's actually a Thanksgiving poem. And it says, thank you, Lord, for this Thanksgiving day. I have a few words I have to say. Thank you for breath to live, for the Holy Spirit to give, for eyes to see, for the strength to be free, for ears to hear, for words that appear, for a mouth to speak, and knowledge to see, for my hands to act, for my feet on track, for my heart to love, for gifts given from above, for my mind to do your will, for my soul to be still, for my body to live, for actions to give, for all of my remaining days to sing your praise, for the birds and the bees, for being on my knees, for colorful butterflies, for the joys and the sighs, for trees dressed in green, for a world to be seen, for mountains on so high, for the clear blue sky, for oceans so deep, for on beaches to sleep, for your animal kingdom, my thanks come within, for a house and a bed, warmth, light, and bread, for music and sound, my thanks are profound, for vision and sight in the glorious night, for weather so pleasant, for angels heaven sent, for the sun that shines, for the jewels that are mine, for family and friends, for love that never ends, for life everlasting. In your love I am basking, for the language of prayer, for always being there, for the miracle of creation, for free gift of salvation. Thank you for you, Lord, for your love is my reward. Amen. See halfway out your eyes, be almost blind, have a job where you're about to lose it any day. I've got a district chief that, that is, 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 calls himself a Christian, but it's after my job. I've got a mortgage over my head I can't hardly pay. I'm, I'm 40 years old and I feel like I'm 50. Feel like I'm 60. Feel like I'm ready to retire and fall apart right now. JD, what are you doing? You got so much to be thankful for. You got your health. You got a beautiful family. You have a job. There's so many people out here that have nothing. You should feel compassion for this district chief. You don't know what he's going through. You should feel forgiveness and loving. What happened to you? I know you're a forgiving, loving man. You have compassion. You have a whole life to look forward to. Retirement. There's so many people in this world look forward to that. Instead of looking down on that, you should be thankful to the Lord to give you this opportunity. I, I think what we need to do is pray about this right now. Don't, don't you all think that that's what we should do right now? Why don't you join us all in prayer, please? Dear Lord, we come before you this morning. We just ask you to lead us, Lord, to guide us, to help us to understand what it is you will have us do. Give us compassion for others. Lord, give us love toward those that, that offend us. Teach us to turn the other cheek, Lord. We give this day to you, Lord, and we just ask that you bless our hearts with your word. And we dedicate the rest of this service to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
The young man was feeling very proud of himself. As a brand new college graduate, he had taken the CPA exams and passed with flying colors. Now he was a full-fledged, certified public <coughs> accountant. His father had been an immigrant to the U.S. and now owned his own little business. Filled with self-importance, the young man began to criticize his father's way of keeping books. He said, Dad, you don't even know how much profit you've made. Over here in this drawer are your accounts receivable. Over there are your receipts. And you keep all of your money in the cash register. You don't have any idea how much you've made. The father answered, son, when I came to this country, the only thing I owned was a pair of pants. Now, your brother is a doctor, your sister is an art teacher, and you are a CPA. Your mother and I own our home, we have a car, and we own this little business. <clears throat> now, if you'll add all that up, subtract the pants, and the rest of it is profit. <laughs> add it up, folks. That's exactly what we need to do during this Thanksgiving season. We need to add it up. We came into this world with nothing but our eternal soul. Amen. That's what God gave us. Everything else is profit. The story is told of a poor man who was given a loaf of bread. He thanked the baker, but the baker said, don't thank me, thank the miller who made the flour. So he thanked the miller. But the miller said, don't thank me, thank the farmer who planted the wheat. So he thanked the farmer. But the farmer said, don't thank me, thank the Lord. He gave the sunshine and rain. He gave the fertility to the soil. And that's why you have bread to eat. Amen. You see, regardless of how sophisticated or how advanced we become scientifically, we still cannot create. We still cannot make a single kernel of corn grow. We cannot make wheat that we plant grow. That has to come from God. God gives us the things we need in order for us to live. That's why Thanksgiving is so important to us each year. We need to remind that we have things to be thankful for. We need it because it forces us to add it all up and to recognize where all these things we enjoy actually come from. The pilgrims didn't have much, but they possessed a great gratitude, and it was upon this very gratitude that America was built. They had a custom of putting five kernels of corn. Most of you, all of you I hope, got five kernels of corn when you came in here. This is a pilgrim custom that they used to do, and they would put five kernels of corn on their plate before every Thanksgiving meal. And they would go then around the table and talk about five things that they were blessed or thankful about that had happened to them over the past year. We have many reasons to be thankful. So let's take these five grains or kernels of corn and using Psalm 103 verses 1 through 5 as a basis, think of five things praise God for. In this psalm, David calls upon his body, mind, soul, and spirit to join in one grand symphony of praise for the benefits God has so graciously bestowed upon him. Let's read. Let me, let me invite you to stand with me in honor of the word of God. And I want to read Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. I'm reading out of the NIV this morning. New international version. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. There ends the reading. You may be seated. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, I come to you again just thanking you 
for the chance to get into your word, for the opportunity to see what you have for us to show us how we can be thankful. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would hide me in the shadow of your cross, that everything I say would be things you want heard, you want said. And Lord, I pray that you would protect the ears that hear what is said, that they would only hear your words. Lord, help us to see why we should be thankful today. We give you praise and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, you have your kernels of corn. And I'm going to kind of talk to you about the five kernels and the five blessings that we have. Let's look at verse 3. And right at the beginning of verse 3 it says, Who forgives all your sins? One day a fellow was visiting with his pastor in the parsonage. He picked up a book that was on the stand and began to read. Suddenly he shouted, Glory! Praise the name of the Lord! Man, I'd like it if somebody would do that. I would just love it if somebody would come into my house and read something that was there and yell, Glory! Praise the name of the Lord! Amen. I would tell me they're excited. Okay, so I lost my spot. The pastor asked, <laughs> what? What's the matter with you? The visitor replied, This book says that in certain places the sea is five miles deep. Yes, that's right, says the pastor. What of it? The visitor answered, Why, the Bible says that my sins have been cast into the depth of the sea. And if it's that deep, I'm not afraid of their ever coming up again. The pressure of the water is so great there that if the largest battleship could be sunk to that depth, it would be crushed like an eggshell. Mm. You ever thought of that? <laughs> Our sins are as far as the depth of the sea. They're cast, gone, history, when we put our trust and faith in Christ. Amen. There's no mistaking it. God offers forgiveness. Praise the Lord. All any person must do is repent and forsake his sin. Turn away. Give it up. And God will forgive him and revoke the penalty of sin. What an awesome thing. From the depths of our hearts, a sense of gratitude should well up. Gratitude should ascend like incense to the throne of God. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ gave, forgave you. The basis of our forgiving others is the forgiveness we have received from God. The basis of our forgiving others is the forgiveness we have received from God. It's not based on anything else. What is the model of Jesus? Did the men who crucified Jesus ask for forgiveness as he hung on the cross? No, they did not. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If you are willing to forgive someone because they have, or if you're not willing to forgive someone because they have not apologized, or because they're not doing things the way you think they should be doing, do both of you a favor and forgive anyway. One day a man and his son had to take a quick trip to town. The father had some real bad, real important business that he had to do, even though it was blizzard conditions outside. Now, I know some of you probably don't know about blizzard conditions, but uh, I know that I have some friends here from Michigan. I said that this week. Next week, I won't say that word. Um, but I have some friends here from Michigan, and I'm from Ohio, and I know what blizzards are like. If you have been up north during a blizzard, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, there was a man walking in the blizzard on their way home. And so the father pulled over and picked up the man. He was sure the weather would have probably killed him otherwise. He jumped in and they got going. And during the drive, the father struck up a conversation with the guy. He, relaxed, or he related that he had just been released from prison. And you could tell by the way he talked that he was nervous about telling my father that. 
because he was afraid that he would throw him out in the cold. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being the person that's out in the cold? The father looked at him and said, well, you served your time, right? I suppose you learned your lesson. And he kept on driving. The man relaxed a bit because he knew he had nothing to fear from the father. The son already had a good bit of respect for the dad, but it went through the roof that day. The son said, he taught me that a man should have every chance to get back on his feet after making a mistake. We should want people to know that we care, regardless, and even more importantly, that Jesus cares. <coughs> and we should want people to know that Jesus wants them to be free. Not just physically free, but spiritually free. Amen. Remember what God has forgiven you. We all have a past. We've talked about that many times over the last few weeks. We all have a past. Remember what God has forgiven you. And if you do that, you'll be less likely to look down on someone else. And you'll be more likely to forgive and forget and join them or <coughs> allow them to join the fellowship. Praise the Lord. Another kernel is the kernel of healing. Also in verse 3 it says, Who heals all your diseases. When first considering this passage of scripture, I was a little bit reluctant to use this. See, God doesn't always heal everyone the way we think that he should. But, the Holy Spirit can help us to see important truths in this verse. And he can lead us and show us how we can really find healing. All healing is divine healing. And recovery from sickness, injury, and surgery is a result of the healing properties that God has built into our bodies. Medicine, surgery, therapy, they're just extensions of God's healing ministry. This verse doesn't say that God heals everyone's diseases. It says that He heals all diseases. There is no disease, there is no sickness that lies beyond his healing power. God can heal anything, including our incurable diseases or what we label as incurable. He is the great physician. The main truth that I learned is that the psalmist is speaking to his soul. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and he who heals all your diseases. The diseases of the soul emanate from the viruses of sin. Jesus identified the virus and its symptoms and its disorders in Matthew 15, verses 19 and 20, where he says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. Just as surely as some disorders of the body can be cured by medicines and surgery, so the soul of man can be cleansed, purged, and purified. They can even be made whole when God, the Holy Spirit, is allowed to possess us completely. Praise the Lord. Will you let God, the Holy Spirit, possess you completely? <coughs> The kernel of redemption is kernel number three, and that is found in verse four, where it says, Who redeems your life from the pit? The London Times publishes the prices paid for the art objects in all of the, sa in all of the sales rooms of the world. If a painting is sold in New York or Paris or Rome or London, the, time give, the Times gives a full details of the sale. You can judge the value of a painting by the price paid for it. And we can judge our value 
by the price Jesus paid for us. The depths into which he had to reach in order to bring us redemption. A former governor of Texas spoke to the assembled convicts in the penitentiaries of that state. He finished by saying that he would remain to listen if any man wanted to speak with him. When the meeting was over, a large group of men remained, many of them lifers. One, of, one by one, they each told the governor that he was there because of, because of a frame-up, an injustice, or a judicial blunder. Each asked to be freed. Finally, one man came up and said, Governor, I just want to say that I'm guilty. I did what they sent me here for, but I believe I paid for it. If I were free, I would do everything I could to be a good citizen and prove myself worthy of your mercy. The governor pardoned this man. Why? Because he admitted his guilt. So it is with us. If we are to be redeemed from the awful sentence we're under, but there's a difference. We can't say we paid for anything. There's an old hymn, and I bet most of you know it. It says, Jesus paid it all. Amen. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Amen. If we will plead his blood, God will redeem us. Which brings up kernel number four. Kernel number four is love and compassion. And again in verse 4 it says, crowns you with love and compassion. In one of Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman's meetings, a man rose to give the following remarkable testimony. I got off the Pennsylvania Depot one day as a tramp. For a year I begged on the streets for, the, for a living. One day I touched a man's shoulder and said, Mr., please give me some money so I can have something to eat. As soon as I saw his face, I recognized him as my father. Father, don't you know me? I asked. Throwing his arms around me, he cried, I found you! I found you! All I have is yours. Think of it, that I, a tramp, stood begging my father for a few cents when for 18 years he had been looking for me to give me all he was worth. How similar this is to the loving kindness and tender mercies of our Lord. Every day, He's looking for us. Every day, He wants to give us what He has for us. In his book, Mortal Lessons, physician Richard Sizer describes a scene in a hospital room after he had performed surgery on a young woman's face. He says, I stand by the bed where the young woman lies. Her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of facial nerve, one of the muscles of her mouth, had been severed. She, she will be that way from now on. I had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh. I promise you that. Nonetheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I had cut this little nerve. Her young husband was in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to be in a world all their own in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they, I ask myself, he and this wry mouth I have made, who gaze at each other and touch each other so generously? The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once, I know who he is. I understand, and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in the encounter with the divine. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I am so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers, to show her that their kiss still works. Amen. Amen. God accommodated himself to us by coming down from heaven as a little baby. He came to us and then he allowed his body to be twisted on the cross 
to show us that the love of God still works. Regardless of the scars that you bear, regardless of how much sin has been in your life, you are loved by God. You are beautiful to Him. You were created in His image. And you bear the likeness of His Son. He will never stop loving you. Amen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. John 3.16 Kernel number five is the kernel of satisfaction and renewal. Verse five says, Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? This reminds me of the words of Jesus given in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's in Matthew 5, 6. The righteousness of Christ should be so sweet to us in our experience that we always want more of what we've experienced. Not only that, but we want that experience over and over and over. We're filled and the filling is so sweet and rich that we want to be filled more. We want to be filled with more. When I see God's righteousness, when I seek God's righteousness, He grants it. Psalm 107, 9 says, He has satisfied the thirsty soul, and the hungry soul He has filled with what is good. Are you hungry today? A famous surgeon was seldom seen on the streets without a beautiful fresh rose in his lapel. His friends wondered why these buds stayed so fresh for so long. When they asked him his secret, he turned open the flap of his coat and revealed a little bottle of water into which the stem of the rose was put. So it is with believers. If our lives draw from the great resources of the Lord Jesus, who is to us the water of life, we will grow more fragrant and beautiful as the years go by. Amen. But that's not the end. In verse 5, he also says, God will renew my youth like the, like the eagles. The eagle is known for its size, strength, and longevity. It's also known for its annual molting. Just as an eagle receives new feathers each year through molting, or through the molting process, I, as a follower of Christ, am constantly being renewed. I'm constantly being refreshed. My soul is revived as I allow God the freedom to mold me into the person He wants me to be. No wonder the psalmist said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Amen. Praise the Lord. As we prepare for our annual Thanksgiving meals, I'd like to take a few minutes for us to remember our Lord's final meal with His disciples. If I could have the people I asked to come forward today, I had a couple of you come in to help me. Uh, we're going to I'll partake in the, the Lord's Supper this morning.
Betrayal, he, he addressed his disciples and he said, This is the body, this is my body. Take this and eat, and do this in remembrance of me. He broke the bread and he passed it, and he invited them to take and eat. Let's do that. then held up a cup, and he said, this is the blood that represents the new covenant that I am making with you. And he asked them to pass it, and to take it in remembrance of him. Let's remember him as we partake. Lord Jesus, I am so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for the body that you allowed to be broken by our hands. The body that you created destroyed you, I guess, at least as far as by as your manly body. And Lord, you laid it down so that we could have life. Hallelujah, you are an amazing Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for that gift of salvation. Thank you for the blood that you shed that day to wash away our sins. And Lord, I ask that you would be blessed by our efforts to serve you. I pray, Lord, that in this Thanksgiving season, we would all be thankful. We would remember that we have things to be thankful for. And Lord, I pray that our lives would bless you in some way. As we go from this place today, Lord, I ask that each of us would go in remembrance of what you have done for us. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're